Welcome fifth graders to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center. We'd like to give a special welcome to a number of schools who are with us this afternoon. Uh, we have students from Arthur Kramer, JT Brashear, Urban Park, Trinity Heights Tag, Mata Montessori, Solar Prep for Boys, John J. Pershing, CM Soto, W.W. Bushman, David G. Burnett, Cedar Crest, and Nancy Cochran. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this virtual field trip. If you are watching this and have not registered for this trip yet, you can still do that by going to www.tiny.cc slash three five registration. Uh, we just use that information for our attendance purposes. And this afternoon's field trip is going to be all about forms of energy. During this virtual field trip, students will explore the uses of energy, including mechanical, light, thermal, electrical, and sound energy. Students will observe that the flow of electricity in closed circuits can produce light, heat, or sound. Students will also observe that light travels in a straight line until it strikes an object and is reflected or travels from one medium to another and is refracted. So we're gonna start things off by exploring mechanical energy with Ms. Schramm. Next, we'll explore thermal energy with Mr. Ramirez. Third, we will explore electrical energy with Mr. Dominguez. And last but not least, we're going to explore light and sound energy with Mr. Monroe. While we're doing all of that, uh, we do encourage you to ask questions. Since this is a virtual field trip, the way you ask a question is you go to www.tiny.cc slash question dash answer to fill out a, a very short form and submit any questions you have for us related to forms of energy. You can ask as many questions as you like and we'll do our best to answer all of them in the time that we have with you this afternoon. So let me stop sharing my screen here and turn things over to Ms. Schramm who's gonna get us started off with mechanical energy. Hi everybody, I'm Ms. Schramm and welcome to our virtual field trip. All right, let me get my screen going. All right, here we go. So at the end of our little section here, um, you'll be able to explore the uses of energy, including mechanical, light, thermal, electrical, and sound energy. And before we get started with all that, just the introduction, what is energy? So a simple definition is energy is the ability to do work. Energy is what allows us to move, to run, to jump, and to play. So here is some energy examples. So this little diagram has forms of energy in the middle, and it has it broken down into six main forms. So we've got mechanical, thermal, electrical, electromagnetic, chemical, and nuclear. So the first four we're gonna talk about, and then nuclear and chemical, that is for another day, and maybe even another grade level. Okay. So what is mechanical energy, since that is my focus? So mechanical energy is the energy of motion or the possibility of motion. So there's two parts, and we'll get a little deeper into that in just a few minutes. So why is mechanical energy important, and how do we even use it? So gasoline converts chemical energy to mechanical energy in cars. Steam engines convert thermal energy into mechanical energy in a train. Your body converts chemical energy from nutrients to mechanical energy for movement. And a power drill converts electrical energy to mechanical energy when plugged in and used. So you may notice a the theme. All of that, of course, involves motion because mechanical energy is the energy of motion. But also there's a lot of mechanical energy in transportation. So cars, trains, planes, all of that use mechanical energy. Also with building things, construction, all those different machinery uses a lot of mechanical energy to get the job done. So I mentioned earlier that there's two parts, the possibility of motion and the motion. So these two parts help make mechanical energy happen. So the first part is potential energy. That is the possibility of movement. So if you look at the little picture there, it's got um, a hammer. And when you hold up the hammer, that hammer has potential energy. It's off the ground, it's higher up, and gravity is going to act on that hammer and it wants it to go down. So when it does, when you move the hammer down, that is kinetic energy, it is moving. Then the mechanical, mechanical energy comes in when the nail is going through the wood. So we've got potential, kinetic, and then mechanical. 
So a few examples of mechanical energy in real life. Um, the first one is um, windmills. If you've ever been driving through the country, you might have seen these big giant windmills and those are at wind farms. So what they do is they are like almost like a big fan. They have blades that um, kind of are hit by the wind and the wind forces them to turn and turns that into mechanical energy. Similarly, the next picture in the middle is a water mill. So the water on this particular example is coming off of the gutters on the house. So the rainwater fell into the gutter and falls onto like little paddles. So instead of the blades, it's got little paddles and that wheel turns and makes mechanical energy. So you can harvest energy from both of those mills and turn it into electrical energy. And then my last example is something we see every day is wheels turning on a car, that chemical energy from um, the gasoline in the car makes those wheels turn, causing it to have mechanical energy. So we're gonna make, we're gonna try little examples of all three of these, but in a tiny, in my classroom version. So let me stop sharing. And I know this is probably going to be very distracting. My hands are very, very purple. I know they're distracting me, but I was collecting um, these little berries off of our spinach vines to collect the seeds. So don't be alarmed. It's just <laughs> from the spinach. Um, okay, so anywho, back to science. All right, so I have my little tree cookie here, just a little slice of wood. And I have my teeny tiny nail and my hammer. All right, so I'm going to do the first example I showed you of potential and kinetic energy. And I'm going to hammer this nail into the wood. Okay, so remember when I lift it up, it's got potential energy. Then when I bring it down, that's kinetic. And when the nail goes in, that is mechanical. Ready, spaghettis? Ah, didn't get my finger, thank goodness. All right, so there you have it, the result of the mechanical energy. And another example of potential and kinetic is when I hold a ball out in front of me. The ball has potential energy because it is held up off the ground. As soon as I let go, gravity is going to act on that ball, causing it to have kinetic energy and it will fall. So let's see, easy. Now, if I wanted to really show you mechanical energy, if I did the same thing with a bowling ball and dropped it, it would smash this table. And that would be mechanical energy and I would get in trouble because I would be out of a teacher table. So let's move on to our other examples. So I told you I was gonna try to show you a mini example of a windmill. So I went out in my garden and I got one of my silly little decorations and this is just a pinwheel, but it works the same way as those giant windmills. So I'm going to breathe in. When I hold my breath in my cheeks, that is potential energy. When I blow the air out, that is kinetic energy. And when that air hits the paddles or like the little blades, then it will cause the wheel mechanism in the middle to turn. And then we have mechanical. Okay, ready spaghettis? Not my best effort, but it does work. And you can also do that with dry dandelions. Hmm. Okay, so next we have, we did the hammer, we did the pinwheel. Now we're gonna do a little version of the water mill. So I have just one of these silly little sand toys that you've probably played with a million times if you've ever gone to the beach or little brothers or sisters play with them in the tub. Either way, it works the same way as a big water mill. So I'm going to create potential energy by holding this water up. When I pour the water in, it's going to have kinetic energy, right? Because it's falling down, it's moving. And when it hits the paddles on the wheel, the wheel is going to start to turn. And there's our mechanical energy. So let's see, ready spaghettis? So a lot of times if you do see these um, water mills, 
they're usually by like a body of water next to a river. Um, the one I showed you was collecting rainwater from the top of the house, but a lot of times they're put next to like a waterfall or a dam or a river and they can use the naturally flowing water that way. And my last little example, oh, thank goodness, I thought she ran away, is my little friend Sally in her car. So she doesn't have a chemical reaction because this is not a real car, but I can make the wheels on her car turn by creating a little ramp, right? So I'm gonna use a force of gravity since I don't have gasoline for this tiny car. So I made a ramp just with a Tupperware lid and sticking it on my beaker. So it's gonna stand up. Now, when I hold Sally at the top with her car, she has potential energy. She's not moving yet. When I let go, that force of gravity is going to act on her car, pulling her down, giving kinetic energy. And those wheels, you know, are going to turn, resulting in my mechanical energy. So let's give her a countdown. Three, two, one. Boom. Easy. Simple as that. So my challenge to you is when you're going around at recess, or I guess it's kind of late in the day, maybe after school, um, try to look around and see if you can find examples of mechanical energy. Every time you see something moving or machinery moving, um, there's a good chance you can figure out what's the potential, what's the kinetic, and then the mechanical energy result. So I hope you had a great time. Enjoy the rest of your field trip. Thank you, Ms. Schramm. Uh, Moises from Soto Elementary asked, when you click a pen, does it make kinetic energy or mechanical energy? Well, it is, let me get my screen turned on here. It is both. So if I click this pen, that when I'm when it's moving, it's it's kinetic and mechanical, but when it stops moving, it would be potential. And the type of potential energy that's in there is if I unscrew this, you can see that there is a a little uh, spring uh, by that pen that allows this you to click it and then unclick it to um, to to have the the writing part come out. And when that spring is pressed in, uh, that is uh, elastic energy. And if it's being held in like that, it would be potential elastic uh, energy. And then Adamaris asked, can anything be a mechanical energy? No. So like, here's a phone. And if I press a button on my phone, you can see there my light came on. But I guess maybe my thumb to move was mechanical. But in the phone itself, it's electrical energy being changed to light energy. And so there's no mechanical energy part uh to that all right now let's uh learn about our second form of energy which is thermal energy with miss ramirez hello my name is miss ramirez and in this segment we're going to be learning about thermal energy uh so before we get started i do have an animal friend for us and this animal friend depends on heat from the sun to help it stay nice and warm so i'm going to give you guys some clues to who this animal is and then i'll let you guys guess so this animal has four legs, a long tail, a beard of skin underneath his chin. It is an omnivore. It is cold blooded and it is native to Australia. So go ahead and make your guess what animal this is and I'll go pull him out. If you guys said some sort of lizard, you would be correct. This is Spike. He's a bearded dragon lizard. He gets that name because he has a beard of skin underneath his chin. When he gets scared or mad, he can inflate that beard really big to make himself look scary. Now, because Spike is a cold blooded reptile, he depends on heat from the sun to help his body stay nice and warm. Now, since he's a classroom pet, he also has a heat lamp. And this heat lamp is turning electrical energy into thermal energy. And the heat is being transferred by radiation. So radiation is a type of heat transfer in which heat um, is being transferred in waves without matter to carry it. So this is the same way that we are able to feel heat from the sun, it's through radiation. So those electromagnetic waves, they're invisible waves, but that is how heat is being carried. So even though I um, 
and not directly touching the heat lamp, I can still feel the heat with my hand. It's very similar to if you guys are by a campfire, you're experiencing and feeling that heat due to radiation. And that's a method of heat transfer. So let's go ahead and talk about what exactly is thermal energy to begin with. So thermal energy is simply the total kinetic energy of particles in a substance. So the faster particles are moving, the more thermal energy they have. So everything, including you and me and everything inside your room is made out of tiny particles. The faster those particles are moving, the more thermal energy they have. So for example, if my hands are cold, what is something I can do to warm my hands up? And you guys can go ahead and show me. Hopefully you guys are rubbing your hands together, right? So when I'm rubbing my hands together, that is friction. I'm rubbing two things together. In doing so, I'm also moving my hands. So that's kinetic energy. And that is also increasing my thermal energy, making my hands nice and warm. It's the same thing if you guys were to go run outside and play, you would probably come back inside all hot and sweaty, right? Another way to look at it is I have a bottle. Inside the bottle are beads. These beads represent particles that make up everything. So right now the beads aren't really moving. They're tightly packed together and they're moving around really slow. This would probably represent something like a solid water, like ice. Now, if I were to shake it just a little, there's more kinetic energy. This would represent maybe a liquid. If I add even more uh, kinetic energy and also increase that thermal energy, that would represent something like a solid. So the more kinetic energy something has, the more thermal energy it also has. So those are related. Another way to look at it is with a thermometer. Y'all are familiar with these. They tell us our temperature. Inside the thermometer is a liquid. When the particles, those tiny particles that make up the liquid, when they get hot, those particles start moving around really, really fast. And because they're moving around really fast, it causes the liquid to rise. Those particles have so much energy. During the nighttime, when it gets cooler, the particles start to slow down. They'll start to shrink. And in doing so, it causes the liquid to go back down. Another example would be a science tool called a hand boiler, which is this little thing here. It works the same way as a thermometer. It has liquid that's very much the same as what's in the thermometer, the type of rubbing alcohol. I'm gonna actually use my body heat to make the liquid rise by increasing the thermal energy of that liquid. So I'm gonna take my hand and I'm gonna press against that glass bulb and the liquid is rising. Because my hand is touching the glass, this method of transfer is called conduction. So when two things are touching, that is conduction. My warmer hand is giving energy, heat, uh, to the glass bowl, which is cooler. So heat moves from warmer to cooler objects. And again, because I'm touching, this is conduction. And that's Pretty much how a thermometer works, the liquid inside uh, gets warm, the particles get excited and move around a lot and they rise. And then when it gets cooler, the liquid uh, starts to shrink back down the tube because the particles start to shrink or uh, kind of slow down. So there's that. The next few things I have are just some fun experiments that demonstrate how heat can change some everyday toys that you might have. The first is uh, this special type of putty. It's called unicorn bark. It changes color with heat. And we call these toys thermochromatic. Thermo means heat, chromatic means color. So I have a candle. I'm gonna use safety by using my tongs. And through radiative transfer, heat from the flame um, is going to start to heat up my putty. It's not actually touching the putty, so it's not conduction. This is another example of radiative transfer. It's going to start to cause a color change. And you can see it's now light blue. I have another example with uh, mood rings. You guys probably have some mood rings. They don't actually tell you your mood. They're actually changing color based upon your body temperature. But also I have some color changing nail polish. 
So if I warm my hand up with the flame, I'm not touching the flame. Again, my hand is just getting warmed up through radiation or that heat uh, from the candle. Notice my colors now. I have a blue color for my nail polish and my ring. I'm gonna put my hand in some cold water and we're gonna see the color change. Because I'm touching the ice, this is conduction. Heat from my warm body is moving to the cooler ice. And we also see a color change for both my nails and my ring. The last one I have for you guys is another type of heat transfer. Y'all are probably familiar with this toy. This is a lava lamp. And this is an example of convection. So convection is heat transfer with liquids and gases. In this case, with our lava lamp, it's with a liquid. There's a bulb in here. When that bulb gets hot, it's transferring heat uh, to the yellow wax. When that yellow wax gets hot, it will rise to the top. Remember, just like our thermometer did? When it gets to the top, it's further away from the heat. So it starts to cool down. And when things get cool, it starts to shrink and it sinks back down and the whole cycle goes over again. So the hot wax rises, then it cools and it sinks and the whole thing just keeps on going. So that's convection. It's heat transfer in liquids and gases. So the last thing I want to do really quick is just show you guys a little video of some heat transfer around the environmental center. So let me start that video. You guys can guess the heat transfer type. Um, so here I have heat from the sun reaches earth by what type of heat transfer? Is it conduction, convection, or radiation? So make your little guess. And we know that prolonged heat and drought cause the water in our pond to evaporate. So we actually don't have any more water in our ponds. And because there's no more water, lots of snails and fish died. So Abby the dog was rolling in thousands of dead snails. That was pretty sad. So heat from the sun is transferred to earth by radiation. Now here I have a candle warmer what types of heat transfer are involved? So think about, is it radiation, conduction, or convection? So the way that heat, uh, the way that candle warmer works, there's a bulb that provides heat. The heat reaches that metal pan, and then the metal pan heats up, and it in turn is heating up the block of wax. So you're seeing a phase change. We're going from a solid to a liquid, and it actually took about, 46 minutes for that entire thing to completely melt. So again, it's two types of heat transfer. It's radiative because we have the heat from the bulb going to the metal lid. It's not touching. It's just the heat's moving through uh, by electromagnetic waves. And then we actually have conduction when we have the heat from the metal lid touching the candle wax, causing it to melt. So there's actually two examples there. Here we have uh, water behind my house. Think about how will decreasing the thermal energy impact water. And we can see here that if we decrease the thermal energy of water, if it goes below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, water will freeze. So the particles of ice are more closely packed and they're more slower moving than liquid water. So temperature impacts things. Here we have heat transfer from the dog paws to the snow. So what type of heat transfer is this? And I'll give you guys a hint. The dog's paws are touching the snow, causing it to melt. So if two things are touching and transferring heat, what type of transfer is that? And hopefully you guys said conductive. And I have an experiment for you guys. Um, all you need are some rubber bands, so super easy. So you're gonna see how does temperature affect a rubber band and then explain. So you're gonna have a rubber band, stick it in the freezer. You're gonna have a room temperature rubber band, just leave it in the room. And then you're gonna have a rubber band that's been heated with a hair dryer. And then um, maybe leave them, like the one that's frozen, leave it in the freezer for a couple hours or something like that. And then after a few hours, you can experiment with flinging them to see how does heat affect how far that rubber band will fling. Um, so I'm going to stop my screen share and that's all I have for you guys on thermal energy. We're going to give it back to Mr. Broughton to answer any questions.
Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. Uh, Elsie asks, can you make something stay in the air? And um, if you're going to get out that hair dryer to do the rubber band investigation, you could also get out a ping pong ball. And if you aim that uh, hair dryer straight up and then turn it on and put the ping pong ball up above, I think it will make the ping pong ball stay up in the air. So you can try that at home if you have those materials. Uh, Neri asked, is cold thermal energy? Yes. Uh, even if something is cold, it still has thermal en energy. You just would have less thermal energy than if it were hot. Uh, what are types of thermal energy? Uh, thermal energy is um, the energy that's contained within a system because of its, its temperature. So there's really not types of thermal energy, but we did see that there's types of thermal energy transfer, which is radiation like from the sun or conduction. And you're going to learn about if you haven't already, conductors and insulators of thermal and electrical energy. And then there's uh, convection, which happens uh, inside the earth under the crust and in a pot of water, if you, if you ever boil a pot of water on the stove. And then uh, can metal turn into thermal energy, Maro asked? No, but metal can conduct thermal energy very well. So like that's why most of the pots and pans in your kitchen are made out of metal. And that's all we have time for for now, but maybe I'll get to some more questions later. But now I think we should move on to electrical energy with Mr. Dominguez. Hola, amigos. Una de mis favoritas cosas que hacer en mi tiempo libre es jugar a videojuegos. Pero yo sé muy bien que sin la electricidad no hay videojuegos. Uh, pero, ¿qué exactamente es la electricidad y de dónde viene? Uh, so, guys, one of my favorite things to do in my free time is to play video games. But I know that without electricity, there's no video games. But what exactly is electricity and where does it come from? So, in this portion of your virtual field trip, I'm going to talk to you about electricity, where it comes from, and I'm also going to help you build a simple circuit that shows the flow of electricity. So, let's get started. Okay, amigos, primero les voy a explicar qué es la electricidad. La electricidad es el movimiento de electrones de átomo a átomo. All right, guys, so let me explain to you guys what electricity is first. So electricity is the flow of electrons from atom to atom. Now, we call this uh, flow of electrons uh, electric current. Now, some matter is better at conducting this electric current than other matter. So that matter that is better at letting electricity flow is called a conductor. This penny and this paper clip are conductors. Now, some matter isn't as good as other matter at letting electricity flow. These are called insulators, just like this rubber tire and piece of paper. Okay, amigos, uno de los usos más importantes de la electricidad uh, en nuestro mundo uh, es para iluminar a nuestras casas, nuestros carros, a nuestros videojuegos. Uh, hay muchas cosas que iluminamos con la electricidad. Uh, para demostrar uh, cómo trabaja la electricidad en un circuito para poder uh, prender este foco, uh, les voy a enseñar uh, cómo usando una batería y unos conductores pueden iluminar uh, este foco. All right, guys, so what I'm going to do to show you uh, that electricity, um, how electricity can help us il illuminate our world. Uh, and remember, guys, we use electricity to uh, light almost, uh, you know, everything around us or else we would be living uh, in darkness. I'm going to set up a, a, a circuit that's gonna kind of show you how that works, okay? So the first thing I'm going to kind of just uh, help you guys understand is that we are going to have a source of power. So think of um, maybe like uh, 
of a power plant. So think of this uh, as a power plant that supplies us with electrical energy. Uh, and, and we're gonna need conductors, right? So uh, these wires are made out of um, matter uh, that, are, um, that are good conductors of uh, electricity, right? So uh, it's great to have electricity, but without matter that can uh, allow electrical current, uh, then it would be pointless to have all this electricity being generated, right? Uh, and then, of course, you can think of this as any light bulb uh, in your house or, you know, out in the street, uh, in your car. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to set up our, um, our power plant. So here's our power plant. And then we need for our power plant to reach us where, uh, where we are, right? So... Pretend that these are the power lines that reach our home, okay? So we have the power lines that reach our home and, and the wires, uh, you know, of power lines are made of highly conductive material, right? So uh, we wouldn't want our power lines to be made out of uh, something that doesn't um, uh, let the uh, electricity, those electrons flow. So after that, pretend that this is your home. Uh, and at our home, we also have a bunch of wiring that allow electricity to flow to uh, our lights and all the other household appliances that need electricity. But let's focus on the lights. And those, of course, are hooked up. And when we hook them up properly, we create a circuit and, and I think you guys saw a little bit of light. We have light. And, and we have light because electrons are flowing from our power source. They are flowing from um, this, uh, the matter, from the matter of our, you know, uh, of our wires to the matter that, uh, that holds our light bulb uh, in place, right? So there we go. And make sure that you complete that circuit because if the circuit is not complete, well, guess what happens? Let's see what happens when we kind of break the circuit. There is no longer uh, a flow of electricity that allow us to have uh, light. All right, guys. So I hope that you guys learned uh, a little something about uh, electricity and how electricity uh, is used to power some of our favorite things. Have a great day, guys. Thank you, Mr. Dominguez. Uh, Gina asked, how is thermal energy made? Uh, so on the sun, um, it is made through a process called nuclear fusion. Um, but on Earth, we would either um, have thermal energy radiated or convected or conducted to some matter, and then that would heat it up and, and cause it to have thermal energy. Uh, then Moises asked, when you have an electrical circuit in a wall, does it make heat energy while it is, or another type of energy? I know it makes electrical. So electrical energy can be changed to light. You just saw Mr. Uh, Dominguez do that. It could also be changed to sound, like in speakers, or mechanical energy, uh, like a toy car that, that runs on batteries. So uh, electrical energy can be changed to lots of different forms of energy. How does the lava lamp work? So that lava lamp has two liquids in it. Uh, the, the liquids that are blobs are kind of a wax uh, form of, of um, that liquid. And when it heats up, it expands and becomes less dense than the other liquid that might just be water in there um, or sometimes another liquid, depending on what type of lava lamp you buy. But once it becomes less dense, it floats to the top. And then when it cools down, it becomes more dense again and sinks back down. But then when it gets to the bottom, it heats back up and becomes less dense and floats to the top and just keeps going over and over again. Uh, then Hurry asked what would happen if animals that needed thermal energy did not have that thermal energy. If they are cold-blooded, they might die rather quickly. If they were warm-blooded, their body would be able to produce uh, some heat or thermal energy for a while. But if it stayed too cold, even a warm-blooded animal could eventually freeze to death. 
Uh, Julian asks, what are atoms made of? And they are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And uh, I'll see if I can answer some more questions at the end. But right now, we're going to explore light and sound energy with Mr. Monroe. Good afternoon, students. My name is Mr. Monroe, and we're going to be studying sound and light energy while uh, you're here with me on your virtual field trip. Well, as we go through this uh, little program here, I want you to really be thinking about how light energy and sound energy may be alike and what makes them different, okay? Also, I want you to take some other things into consideration. We see light energy all around us. We also get exposed to sound energy too. And you know, they have a difference in speed. I want you to be able to, to, to determine which is faster. Well, to get us started, I'm going to do a short PowerPoint. And if you'll bear with me, I'm going to share my screen with you just for a minute. And at the end of that, I'm going to share a couple of uh, items to help us understand that uh, sound energy and light energy are very important to us. Okay, sound and light energy. Wow, you guys have heard about all the other forms of energy, but these forms of energy are very important. We're gonna start out with sound. You know, there are some words that I really want you to understand as we go through this presentation. Vibration is one that you really have to know about, especially dealing with sound. That's the back and forth movement of matter. And that is very instrument in the sound that we do here. Now, when that sound is really loud, we say that the volume is too loud. Volume is the loudness of, of sound. When we talk about the pitch of sound, we're talking about how high or low a sound is. And then there's the word frequency, the number of vibrations per minute. You know, sound energy travels through the air. So it's on the move, right? So we consider sound energy a type of kinetic energy. A vibration is a back and forth movement of matter. The vibrations make the air vibrate, and this is what you hear. The loudness of the sound, of course, we just mentioned that, is volume. Volume is measured in decibels. A high decibel uh, sound is loud and has lots of energy. Sound waves move through the air as waves. Some sounds are high while other sounds are low. A sound's pitch is how high or low the sound is. The number of vibrations in a second is the frequency of a sound. Frequency and pitch are related. A sound with high, fre high frequency has a high pitch and a low pitch has low frequency. Sound waves move in all directions from an object. A sound that hits a hard surface bounces back and it is called an echo. And you guys have probably heard echoes. You can he often hear echoes in caves and if you're deep, deep in a canyon somewhere. Sound waves move like dominoes. When you push one, the next one falls down. Some waves move this way. They travel through the air because particles, the air, give energy to others nearby. Sound can travel a long distance but the particles stay in the same place. A kind of matter can vibrate and carry, carry sound. Matter that carries sound is called a medium. Some waves need a medium to tra travel. The speed of sound depends on the medium. Sound travels fastest in solids and slowest in gases. Sound also moves fast when it is warm, that when it, it moves faster when it is warm than it does when it is cold. Animals can hear sounds that humans cannot hear. Boy, they got good ears. Dogs can hear high-pitched sounds. Bats have excellent hearing, 
And when they fly, they produce sound which bounces off objects. The bat can hear its echoes and this allows the bat to fly in the dark. Boy, that's cool. Now, talking about light. There are some vocabulary words that you're going to need to know to understand light energy. Reflection. Reflection is the bouncing of heat or light off of an object. Opaque means not allowing light to pass through the material. Translucent means that it is allowing only some light to pass through. Then the other word that I want you guys to understand is transparent. If material is transparent, that means it's clear and the material, it will allow light to pass through. And then there's the word refraction, the bending of light as it moves through one material into another. And of course, we're not gonna to get to cover concave lenses today or convex lenses, but just to let you know, concave lenses are lenses that is thick at the edges, thicker at the edges than in the center. A convex lens is a lens that is thicker at the center than at the edges. Light. Light is a form of energy that travels in waves. Unlike sound, this is the difference. Light does not need a medium to travel through. It can travel through a, what we call a vacuum. It could be an airless space and light will travel through it. Just like in this lab right here, the ceiling in this lab is so high. I mean, this room is lit up completely. Light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the part that we can see is called visible light. The waves that make up the spectrum have different frequency. And that's something that's similar to sound because remember, we use that same word with sound waves. Light waves are different from sound waves. Light waves move like ocean waves because they move up and down. Light waves can travel through matter or through empty spaces, just like I mentioned before. Light moves thousands of times faster than sound. It only takes eight minute, minutes for light to travel from the sun to the earth. Wow, that's something. Now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen right here and we're gonna talk a little bit more about sound and light. I'm gonna start out by talking about sound. You remember sound is the vibration of matter and that can be created a variety of ways. I can remember when I was in high school, no, not in high school, cause that's not when I started. When I was in grade school, I wanted to be in the band and the instrument that I wanted to play was called a slide trombone. I wish I had one here today so I could show you. Well, to start us out learning how to play that slide trombone, the band director gave us, instead of giving us the actual horn, he gave us the mouthpiece that you would put into the horn. And I thought, boy, this is not any fun. So he had us put the mouthpiece up to our mouth and he had us vibrate our lips like, like that. And I thought, what good is that? Well, we did that for about a week and then he actually gave us the horn. And he had us do the same thing with the mouthpiece inserted into the horn. And I was amazed of the sound that came out of the end of that horn just by me, what was I doing? Vibrating my lip, okay? So vibration played a very big part in making that sound that came out of the end of that horn. And then later on, once I got into high school, I was invited to play in the jazz band. Of course, I played a different instrument. It was called a bass fiddle. And instead of blowing into it, it looked like a great big oversized fiddle that you see people using the, the uh, wand and playing on the strings. This thing stood about this tall and I had to hold it upright and it had strings. I tried to make something similar to that out of a ruler, centimeter ruler, and just one rubber band. Now, this is just a rude form. And I tried to create a similar sound by using the rubber band stretch. And 
You can hear that vibration, can't you? And you guys can make instruments by stretching something like this too and getting that sound, okay? Vibration of matter. And then it doesn't necessarily have to be something like that. It could be something that you could strike. For example, this little instrument. We see that there's a piece of metal here, piece of metal here, piece of metal here, and it's kind of flexible here. It kind of gives a little bit. Each one of these is a different length. And if I take something and I strike it, that's a vibration, right? Another strike and another different sound because of the difference in length. And that is, again, vibration of matter, sending out sound waves. Now remember, sound waves need a medium to go through, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about light energy before I run, oops, but I'm about out of time. Light energy is a little different. Light energy doesn't have any mass. It doesn't, have, doesn't weigh anything. In fact, light energy is made up of tiny little particles that we call photons. And those photons are all over. It's almost like if you went to a beach and you saw a, a beach, all that sand out there, you wouldn't be thinking about that little bitty tiny grain of sand. You'd just be thinking about that beach out there. Well, guess what? Same way with light energy. We're not thinking about the tiny little particles that has no mass, no matter. It's just pure energy making up all this light in this lab. And there are several ways that light performs. It's not made up of matter, but it does travel in straight lines. And there are several things that light does. Since it travels in straight lines, you know what? It can reflect off objects, and that's how we see things. I'm seeing all the objects in this room simply because of the light energy bouncing from the ceiling lights to those objects and then back to my eyes. That's how I'm seeing those things. I turn the light switch off. I'm not going to see any objects in this room. It'll be dark in this room. There will be no reflection. And there are some objects that reflect so well that it will give you the impression that it has a light source of its own. Smooth objects that are made out of metal. One particular object is a mirror. This mirror right here, if I shine this flashlight and I shine it right where the reflection is right, if I can get that right there. Yep, back it up. There we go, get the right reflection. It gives you the impression that that mirror is a light source of its own. You know what, and that's what happens with our moon, guys. The sun is actually sending light rays or light energy to our moon. And that light that the moon is giving off is not the moon. It's actually rays or light energy coming from our sun that's being reflected back to us. Then some objects, like translucent, translucent uh, objects, they will not let a lot of light through. They kind of absorb some of it. For example, like this lamp. Now, this lamp is not letting, it has a shade on it that's not letting all the light come through it. Now, if I take that shade off, you can see that light is really bright. So the shade is absorbing some of the light's energy. Then there's half, then there's, we've got objects that refract light. Remember what I said? Light travels in straight lines. Well, when it's going through two different types of transparent matter, well, clear glass, got water here. If I stick a straw in here, watch what happens. If you look at the edge right here, you can see that straw looks like it's broken, but it's not broken. It is actually bending the light waves, the light energy, so that it does appear like it's broken. Well, I have actually run out of time, guys. So I hope I've been able to help you understand a little bit about sound, a little bit about light energy. And listen, I hope you guys have a good rest of the day. I'm gonna give it back to Mr. Broughton and we'll see you later. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Um, we received uh, like 20 more questions from um, the students at Soto Elementary, but I will email uh, the answers uh, to those questions to your teacher. So you should have those by tomorrow. And um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to learn about forms of matter, uh, forms of energy uh, with us.
Uh, we hope you enjoyed this virtual field trip and you can let us know whether you did or not by going to www.tiny.cc slash three dash five feedback and filling out a short for feedback form for us. We hope to see you again in about three weeks during our next field trip for fifth graders. Have a great rest of your day. And we'll see you next time.